Surf's up. We are here with another episode of the Maui Snake Show, and I have such an honor to bring you a veteran, a pioneer of the esports space. It's Jason Lake, the founder and CEO of Complexity. Thank you so much for making time in your busy schedule, Jason, to Absolutely. hop on. Of course. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So I want to go way back to start this off. I, I need people to know just how much of a, of a trailblazer you really are in this space. You were the founder of Complexity 20 years ago in 20, yep. 2003. And I want to know, first off, what sparked the interest to try to make esports feel big time to make it feel like showtime because you were one of the first people that was basically investing all of your time to make it above and beyond just a five-man lineup just playing counter-strike showing up whenever yeah. you wanted to make this feel as professional as possible yeah i mean absolutely I, i've told this story before but generally you know i grew up uh, an american football player and my family played in lots of different sports my my brother almost went pro uh, professional in baseball he played at arizona um in college so we just i came from a sporting family very competitive but i also grew up um really addicted to video games man like you know i'm giving my age away even more but i go back to the atari days and the N nintendo days and i was around kind of at the birth of the internet <clears throat> but as i got into college and law school um, I really wasn't playing many video games at all. And I got out of law school. I was taking some time off and traveling and just kind of partying, hanging out before, uh, before I started my, my law practice. And I walked into a friend's apartment one night in this high rise in Atlanta that we were living in, get ready to go out for the night and, you know, chase, chase ladies. And, uh, <laughs> he was playing this game on his PC and I'm like, what the hell is that? And he's like, oh, it's called counter-strike. <clears throat> and I'm like, wow, that's crazy. So I downloaded the game, started playing, was instantly hooked I mean, this was when, uh, you know, I, I think I still had a 56 K dial up. It was, it was early days. Um, and I would just love the game and I was addicted to the game playing op map playing, you know, pool day and, and ice world and, you know, all the, all these old school maps. Aztec was actually my favorite way back in the day. Um, <laughs> you don't want to say that too loudly. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I just decided that, uh, you know, or, or I skipped a I skipped a step, and then I discovered there was already competitions. You know, um, there's QuakeCon around Quake, and CPL was running competitions, and I'm like, wait a minute, the Swedish players are coming over here and playing this team at the time called Team 3D, and I'm like, and it was like a light bulb moment for me. It was like the meeting of my very competitive nature and my absolute adoration and love for for video games, and. I've always kind of been an entrepreneur. I was always a kid, you know, at the lemonade stands and going to business conferences, kind of like a nerd in ninth grade. And I, I, was, I was always an entrepreneur. So when I realized I had an intersection of two things I was really passionate about, my first thought was my light bulb moment was like, we can turn this into a business. And really at the time, the sport was so young. It was very much um, a hobby more than a business, especially in North America. I think Europe was definitely a little ahead of ours. So I fired up an LLC and, uh, you know, started hiring professional gamers and just kept improving the level of gamers until we were winning world championships. And I guess you could say the rest is history. But yeah, that culmination of my passion for co competition and love of video games and kind of a light bulb entrepreneurial moment is really what led to the birth of complexity. It was 20 years ago this summer, like you said. So we've been doing this for a little while and, you know, I, I, or building a brand like this over decades has been really interesting. And I'll be able to reminisce a little bit with you here today because I've seen so many brand, brands like just come out big explosion of fireworks and just going crazy and spending tons of money and and just all guts and glory and they're gone i've seen so many people over the years come in with all this just like massive talk of world domination and they're gone probably in crypto or something now so i'm proud of the fact that me and my gaming family um collectively have been able to to last this long um we've you know for the last call it five, 10 years. We haven't been the biggest brand. We haven't been the flashiest brand. We haven't, you know, had nonstop merch drops or whatever. Um, but 
I've always considered this very much a marathon more than a sprint. And of course, we want to provide a compelling product for our fans. Of course, we want to be as competitive as, as humanly possible in a difficult ecosystem where there's no salary caps and and whoever spends the most money, quite frankly, can can often hoist the most trophies. But Complexity has always been a brand that's been built on professionalism. We try to do things with integrity to the very best of our ability. And we have a very long-term perspective, maybe because I'm so old and, and I'm still, um, you know, guiding the ship. But even now, you know, I was watching uh, your podcast with Richard Lewis. You're talking about some of the new big upstart, very highly funded orgs. Like, I always sit back and, uh, you know, just kind of smirk and say, well, let's let's see what happens. If you're going to come out and burn $100 million, $200 million bucks in three or four years, can you create a sustainable business? Can you create a sustainable sports property that's going to last um, generations? And that's really what I want for complexity is to be a generational sports property. And uh, I think we're building that. You know, it's 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 tough out there right now, as everyone knows, but uh, very proud to have uh, made it 20 years at the very least. Yeah, congratulations for that, because like you were mentioning, there have been so many organizations that just come out guns a blazing. They want to try to make a mark on the space immediately before thinking about how do they actually create a revenue stream. They might actually find some really big investors, but I think we're starting to see that reckoning right now in yes. what many are calling the esports winter as yep. in 2018 alone there were four billion dollars or more invested in esports and now yep. people are finally saying okay how do we get back some money on our investment and that leads me to the question for you what makes an esports org profitable what where where are the revenue flows right yeah i mean uh <clears throat> You, get, you have the obvious revenue streams, um, like corporate partners, like we work with Lenovo Legion, obviously, and it's also our naming rights partner, a fantastic partner, and, and multiple other great partners. So you'll see the sponsorship models. Um, there's different revenue streams, including digital items like Counter-Strike stickers and, and other types of in-game items. Um, like, for instance, Rocket League, um, they allow you to work with a corporate partner to brand the in-game car, and that adds a lot of unique value. Um, there's revenue shares from the leagues you take part in. Um, like we're in the Louvre Agreement and, and, and Blast and and other programs. And it's a really complicated um, subject once you really start diving into it. But the revenue streams have diversified over the years. I think the idea behind the franchises like Overwatch and, and, and Call of Duty and LTS and some other things um, – may not be panning out exactly as they anticipated, but I did always like the idea that that the teams, the players, and the leagues are in this together. We need to collectively figure out how to drive revenue. We have the eyeballs. We have the core demographic that advertisers want to work with. Um, but I think the thing that we've struggled more than anything over the last, call it seven years, um, has really been properly monetizing the product. I know Richard Lewis speaks to this a lot and, you know, I love Rich. I've known Rich a long time and he gets on the fans like you're not willing to pay $3 to watch a tournament or whatever. You want everything served on Twitch or kick for free, but then you're mad when this happens and that happens and this happens. And it is a core fundamental issue with this business. Um, and we need to properly figure out how to monetize. And I know people that are general fans and love playing the games. I'm a gamer, obviously. Um, and just love watching, you know, Elise get aces or, or whatever their favorite game is. They don't care about the business side. But the problem is, without the business side, um, Elise and, and wonderful players like him are not getting the big salaries. They're not being flown around the world. They're not getting $25,000 boot camps. Like, none of this works at a global um, level that's really compelling to a larger fan base without the business side. Um, and, and part of me, and I, I keep going down these rabbit holes, but part of me, quite frankly, if I had one disappointment and call it the last five or six years, is how much time I spend on corporate stuff and how much time I spend on the business stuff. Like, I'm a fan at heart. Anyone who's seen me at these events, like, I get into it. Like, I, I love watching competitive gamers. And, and, and it's really, like, part of the core of who I am. Um but there's also realities. Like if I can't pay the rent and I can't pay my players and I can't buy plane tickets and these other things, everything crumbles really quickly. So while I completely understand why, you know, a, 
a 20 year old fan that might have zero interest in the, the business side of esports. It all goes hand in hand and we need to all be rowing the, the same direction um, yeah. when it comes to business and revenue. Yeah, what people need to realize if they don't already by now is that Elige is a much better player because he doesn't have to work worry about the other finances in his life because he's able to solely direct himself to playing this game and he has the luxuries of most of the other yep. things financially in his life are taken care of because of the salaries. We're getting we're able as fans to witness even better gameplay. If he had to yeah. spend an extra couple hours doing some menial task that now the yeah. funds in his, his life allow him to just kind of ski, skip by, this is a better product, it's better entertainment. I had Absolutely. To... And let me jump in there. I think there's yeah. also been a false illusion for many years that teams are just these organizations you know, bathing in cash money and it's fallen out of the sky. You know, whatever meme you want to use, when in the reality is... The truth, the reality is the teams are squeezed between the game developers who make literally Mount Everest of cash. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And quite frankly, the pros who who justifiably and understandably are, are getting these, you know, pretty nutty salaries. And I'm not saying they don't deserve that, but the teams are always squeezed in the middle. So they've gone out and raised venture capital and, and other things. But now we're starting to see that come, kind of come back around where investors and, uh, and others are like, Hey, where's the return here? Like, why are these franchise leagues not producing? Like, why is there such a burn rate, you know, five years into my investment? Like what is the path to prof profitability? How can you create sustainability? Um, and the teams are squeezed. Uh, so I think that's definitely part of the natural phase and evolution of, of ecosystems and markets. But, you know, right now it's, it's tough sliding out there for sure. And that actually leads me to a, a pressing matter in the Counter-Strike space, which is that you've already mentioned the fact that you guys are a partnered team. You, you're with ESL, you're with your Louvre Agreement team, you're with Blast as well. But with Valve in 2025, they've talked about how they want to dissolve all of these types of part ownership programs in these franchise leagues. And I... what. For, for complexity, uh, you guys have at some times fielded a roster that would have been strong enough uh, by merit alone to have punched up. You know, you guys have been top 10 multiple times and you guys would have earned that spot. But there's other times when you guys probably had a less competitive roster. Usually right. it's one where you're going through switches between players and kind of pivoting from the European roster you had to the North American roster. And in those moments, you probably benefited because you guys still got the reps in tier yeah. one competition. So... When those leagues dissolve, what do you think the impact is going to be on complexity? That is a really fantastic question. We could probably do a podcast just on this topic alone. And this is where the nuances of esports can become really challenging. Because if you look at traditional sports leagues, these, the, these leagues are formed and, and you have a slot and you are sitting at the table collectively um, you might be dealing with, say, a player's union or whatever for the players, but everyone's kind of at the table. In esports, someone owns the football, <laughs> which is really a first in, in kind of global sporting entertainment, um, and it adds a lot of nuances. As a lawyer and businessman, I completely respect the fact that Valve wants to protect its IP, and Valve wants to shepherd that IP in a way they feel is best for Valve. Makes sense. But... I also, you know, when I read some of the sentiment on Reddit or, or HLTV or just where the fans are, are, are talking in, in chat. You read HLTV comments. Yeah, yeah. You know, some days I feel like whipping myself over the back. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay, okay. But, just uh, making clear. Yeah, I, do, I always try to stay in the forums. Sometimes mm -hmm. I comment more than others, uh, but I always need to keep my finger on the pulse of yeah. what do the fans think? Like, I care what they think. Like, totally. ask anyone who... who goes on reddit they've seen me post on there many many times and obviously i stay out of out of out of everyday conversation and hot button issues but yeah it's really important to me and i think there was a sentiment well like well these teams you know liquid and eg and complexity and da 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 they got together with louv and it was an anti-competitive idea where we'll just get a permanent spot in the league and then our competitive teams they won't have this spot and it you know gamers tend to be cynical and they they tend yeah. to they tend to want to give negative motivations where or ascribe negative motivations when they're not really there and honestly the, it was more the idea of what i was referring to earlier is the teams get squeezed from from both sides 
at, at all times. And we're trying to build sustainable business. We want to sit down with like-minded leagues and be like, how can we do this together? And, and it's not necessarily any one moment. What roster do you have? Oh, you, we're going to, we want you to be a partner to what roster do you have? No, no, no. It's bigger than that. It's like, how do we bring in like-minded people that have business acumen? How can we develop products together? How can we better market together? How can we increase the, the fan growth and, and activation and, and interaction together? Let's get on the same team and build this together. And then let's share the revenue. Let's share the upside. Like, let's do it collaboratively. And the players get a caught in that was the idea. And I understand, like, if you're one of the teams that's not sitting at that table, you're like, hey, you know, I want to invest in a Counter-Strike team, and it's unfair. This team isn't very good right now. And, you know, my team's actually better than this team, but they're in the league because they have this slot. I, I get that. I've been on both sides of that equation. I think the larger issue is we have to solve for some of the economic challenges that are, are really plaguing the ecosystem. I personally wish I could have had a sit down with Valve to kind of present both sides of this. And, and it's still, I think, an ongoing conversation. I think Valve is understanding of, of where we're at. The, the collective teams have invested tens and tens of millions of dollars to support this ecosystem, pay players to, to be a, you know, an important part of everything that's going on, for example, in the Counter-Strike world. And to be honest, we got hit out of left field with this. There were, you know, I think there could have been a little more conversation, but I think there, those conversations are happening now. But just to the average fan, I want to say there's not always these evil motives like, oh, well, let's just get together and we'll be members. And then those teams are screwed. It was never meant to be like that. It's more like, let's find organizations that have a proven track record in this game, that care about this game, that have business acumen, that have real functioning communities. And let's try to get on the same train and let's try to grow this thing together rather than the wild west sporadic scattered craziness that we've had where no one was really winning um that at least from my perspective i can't speak for everyone was the underwriting philosophy of why these things were formed it was in a it was like a we could all do this better together mm -hmm. we can create a better product with better marketing and more revenue streams if we're all working together and and go from there so It'll be interesting to see how all that plays out. And like I said, we could we could do a podcast about that topic alone in, in, in the Counter-Strike ecosystem. Um, yeah, it's crazy times. I would say that for a lot of people, everybody is familiar with the fact that you guys have this secured slot. And I, but I think it goes beyond just you having a chance to show yourself in tier one competition regularly because you have that slot. Um, yeah. I know that there's a financial component with it as well. And I don't think that there is the most public clarity regarding what that incentive is to be part of the league, because obviously when you invest that much into purchasing a slot, you want some sort of return. Would you mind, is there any way you can share what sort of revenue you're finding? Because we were talking about different revenue streams and all that. What sort of revenue stream you get from being a partner team? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a very good question, and I, and I think it's a justified question. I always have to be careful with these things, again, back to the business side. Like, mm -hmm. anytime you're in a business relationship, there, there's NDAs, and, and there's a lot of other people at the table, and it's not my position to kind of be going into those details. Um, okay. And then I, I get angry messages as soon as this drops on YouTube. Uh, but at a high level, yeah, there, there's revenue sharing and there's collaborative marketing and, and trying to improve the product and, and collaborating with the players and getting their feedback on the product and trying to create a win-win-win a for the league, the players, the teams. And that was kind of the genesis of, of why the programs were set up. Now, I don't think it's necessarily going to be a death knell um we we want to and of course we have to honor what val's wishes are in this are there business arrangements and marketing that could still be done and with player interaction and and everyone's still winning i mean i think a lot of really smart people are investigating that right now while still honoring val's rules around their game and and slots or or whatever and that, that's very much an ongoing conversation um you know, I've been dealing with Valve and, and Counter-Strike in, in this world for, you know, 20 years now. And uh, I'm very grateful that Valve is engaged on the on the level they are. Mm. And when I say the level they are, you see some developers who've got 
so into their esports ecosystem that it hasn't always worked out really well, has it? <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I think I if I was like put in charge of running the esports division of a major developer, there is a balance where you want to be supportive. You want to be providing in-game revenue opportunities. You want to be making sure the, the players are taken care of, making sure the fan experience is taken care of. But the there's also a benefit to having open circuits and, and old school LAN events that are possible and, and some of these other things. So I think Val does a pretty good job of, of riding that line. It's been interesting, um, you know, being in the Counter-Strike universe the last 20 years, but I'm really optimistic um, with the launch of CS2 and uh, everything that's going to be surrounding that over the next five years. How much would it help these this ecosystem for orgs and players if Valve actually extended the sticker money to just teams that qualified for the RMR? Anytime you can extend, let me say this, anytime you can offer an organization and a player the opportunity to have digital items in a game like Counter-Strike, you are directly benefiting them. I, I absolutely get like, hey, let's make the major special where the only way you get your IP or your signature for a player in the game is if you qualify it makes it aspirational it makes it exciting um but yeah I'm, I'm a big believer in collaborating with the ip holders the game developers and publishers so that the teams and the players and the other stakeholders have more revenue streams and offer more unique products to their fans too um, does that mean that 10,000 Counter-Strike teams and 50,000 Counter-Strike players should all have their stuff in the game? No, of course not. But I'm always open to broader and then let the free market decide like, hey, this team's more popular. They're, they're going to make more revenue. That player's more popular. He's going to make more revenue. But the more people that can eat at the table um, at the tier one level, uh, I'm for it. I want to talk more about complexity and the transition you guys had a, a couple of years ago where you were acquired by the Dallas Cowboys and now you're you've kind of you know you yeah. tweaked your logo a little bit it's like you know reminiscent of the the cowboy the Dallas Star yeah. or the Cowboys logo it is yeah. and um, I want to what, what sort of resources has that acquisition provided you man it's been it's been a crazy it's been a crazy ride. I gotta be honest with you. Again, I think <laughs> okay. I think just that question we could we could do a, a whole podcast. Um, first let me say like working with the Cowboys organization and, and the Jones family and our other investor at the time, the Goff family, it's been one of the greatest honors of my life. Um, we've learned so much from being uh, associated with them and working with them. What we built out here, I'm sitting on their campus. Uh, this campus is a couple billion dollars. It's got like this huge stadium over there and office buildings and a hotel and a sports therapy hospital. When we came here, I set out to build um, what I call esports 3.0. It was kind of the evolution of player care and training. For example, our players, we'd provide luxury apartments about a quarter miles away from here so they didn't have to live in a game house and constantly be surrounded by their teammates. You could, you know, br bring uh, bring home, you know, your partner and, and, or parents could come visit and you, you'd have privacy. We were making sure we covered their nutrition where they were eating at the Dallas Cowboys training table getting the same nutritious food as the Cowboys players. Like there's a whole cafeteria just for Cowboys players. There's a gym on the property to get free gym access or expected to be working out. We have a sports therapy hospital on the property. You can't even make this up. You know, they get to go over, get any preventative, um, reactive medical care and make sure they're getting the best medical care. Then they come over here to the Lenovo Legion eSports Center, and we've got some really advanced um, technology in here. We can pump in crowd noise. We could do anything with this computerized lighting system. A lot of teams like to boot camp here. And, of course, we've got the best internet, which is centrally located in the United States for a competitive advantage. Hell, we even have a giant battery backup. So if our teams are in a game and we lose power to a storm or something, they keep gaming and they come out of the room. They don't even know that the power's <laughs> been out for a couple hours. Wow. Like, we've okay. gone to great lengths to really build one of the most advanced um, training and player support um, systems anywhere in the world. And of course, we have our mental coaches because mental health is one of the most pressing issues in, in esports. And, it, and it's incredibly taxing to live the life of a pro gamer with all the travel and everything else. So we, we built all this out and we're extremely proud of it. And of course, 2020 came along and derailed the juggernaut Counter-Strike roster, which was incredibly disappointing after how hard we worked to put that together. Um, but hey, the pandemic, you know, was was global and everyone went through their own things during that time. On the back of that, 
um, we did an all-stock transaction and made us part of the Game Square family, and uh, which we are today. And you know, uh, things things are always kind of uh, in flux, and you're always trying to figure out what's best for for moving forward. And of course, we did uh, align with our sister company, the Cowboys, and we're still honored to have different collaborations and associations with them. Um, I think there's there's love both directions there. I'm curious, so whoever's in the comments uh, on the video, let me know if you if you if you like the blue or you like the old red and black. You can tweet at me and post here on on Maui's uh, <laughs> YouTube. But it's been a it's been a crazy ride, and and I don't I don't think the ride's necessarily over. This is the first 20 years, and uh, I've definitely got a lot of gray hairs and probably a few ulcers I'm not aware of yet. But it's it's been. It's been an amazing ride. If you would would have told me in 2003 you're going to be sitting on the campus of the Dallas Cowboys, you have flown in Jerry Jones's helicopter and had a gigantic gaming event in this indoor arena across the street, I probably would have chuckled a little bit. But uh, it's been fun. I feel very, very blessed, as do my coworkers, uh, many of which have been with me over a decade, um, to have experienced this to have learned from the most valuable sports franchise in the world. And hopefully we're able to continue taking what we've learned and, and build a brand that people can get behind, build a brand that people are excited about and build a brand that's multi-generational. Nothing makes me happier. I think in this business than when people show up with young children be like, I was a complexity fan 15 years ago and here's my son or my daughter. And, we want to get them a complexity shirt. Like that's multi-generational and that's when esports becomes, you know, more of a traditional sport. And that's proof that we've built something meaningful. Yeah. I've actually said this publicly a few times, mostly on stream or just uh, in smaller conversations here and there. But the fact is that when I was getting into the Counter-Strike space myself, it was around the same time as like a little bit before CGI and CG then CGS following that. Yeah. And I'm the, impressed you remember CGI, man. That, that's I, a footnote right I went, there. I boy. went to it. I went to CGI. <laughs> oh, no way. It's yeah, it's, it's, I was in the audience for CGI. Actually, if you yeah, look through a YouTube famous, video, uh, you can Shaguar, see me. That was the famous Yeah, now, Swedes. That's from there. Yeah, I was yeah exactly. I exactly. Was and there. and the fact is that a lot of the orgs at that time have kind of fallen off. Like Team 3D was kind of, it was basically, if you were a North American Counter-Strike fan, you're basically either a Team 3D fan or you were a Complexity fan. The other franchise teams that were made at that time, like Carolina Core, Chicago Chimera, they didn't, they were just kind of made up for the league a little bit. But Team 3D yeah, and Complexity, like everybody, everybody knew that these were the real deal because they were there before. And yeah. you guys have stood the test of time. So congratulations on just getting yeah. getting the acquisition from from the Cowboys. I'm sure that was like a just a huge deal for you. Like, how did how did they approach you on this whole thing starting? Um, I had been from about 20 late 2014 through early 2017 or so i'd been out kind of on uh, the investor road show you call it groups like c9 and 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 others had really come into some meaningful capital and were quickly pricing us out of the market like if i was paying a this makeup numbers if i was paying a counter-strike player two thousand five hundred dollars a month my competitors were coming in and offering 10 grand a month so even though we're pretty good at identifying and developing talented players, if you spend all that time and energy doing that, and then someone just comes along and they can afford four X what you're able to afford to pay them, you become a, a you know, a seed team really quickly you become, you know, kind of a, a triple a ball club, if, if you will. And that's not yeah. the intention that we had. So we set out, man, I met Elon Musk. It was pretty cool. I, I met, you know, the, the Cronkies. I, I met so many big sports owners and we were trying to figure out what would be best for us. What was the right fit? And um, Travis Goff was actually introduced to me and the Goff family here in Dallas are, are friends with the Jones family. And he said, Hey, you know, we're kind of interested in making an investment in esports, and the more we talked, the more I, I could tell we were aligned. And they flew me out here, and I toured this facility called the Star, um, and I was just so blown away um, by this facility. There's tours and things you can find online that I instantly knew this was the esports 3.0 that I wanted to build. That this was the right group to build it with, and uh, this is the brand I wanted to build it alongside. And yeah, that's kind of how the, all that went down. It's uh, it, it, it's been a it's been a surreal ride and like i said i feel incredibly blessed um to still be here and i'm really grateful to all the people 
that have invested in this brand, the people that have worked their tails off and devoted their adult lives to this brand. And of course, I'm super appreciative to the fans because the fans and, and their interaction and their support, whether it's on social or Reddit or buying a shirt or showing up in the Discord, the fans are, are, are the jet fuel to any brand like this. Um, you see it all around the world. The biggest brands, the biggest influencers, where do they get their jet fuel? It's their fans. If, if you can drop a video in your Mr. Beast, you get 25 million views. Like it's the people that, that follow Mr. Beast that are, engage with Mr. Beast that at, that create his market value and, and create the amazing brand that he's created. If you have a sports team, you see this even in franchise leagues like the NBA or the NFL, like technically they're all equal, but like you said earlier about team 3d and complexity, these there's groups that have way bigger fan bases and you see their hoodies and you see their shirts everywhere. The fans need to understand how much um, people like me appreciate them because without you, we're, we're all just kind of shouting into the void. So it's been a crazy ride and I'm very, very grateful to all those people I just mentioned, especially the fans. Yeah. And I think it's worth noting that you say you're, you're shouting into the void, but I truly do believe that even if there weren't all of this, Dallas Cowboy acquisition, all the money that's flowing in, you would still be there because you were. You were there when there was practically no money on the table. And I actually did want to ask you, like, I'm sure you like you said, you were studying, you were in law school, you ended up making this pivot and you could have you could have definitely given given how hard you've worked in this space if you had devoted yourself to law you could have probably been a top top tier lawyer you could have made tons on it but what were like early signs that this had potential to be something in your eyes like was there ever a moment where you were like like you you, you committed pretty early to this space and yeah. it didn't seem financially justified now no. it's probably a little <laughs> bit better but just a little bit you know oh man man <clears throat> When, when I started Complexity, you know, we were lucky enough to have a couple small sponsors and, you know, some headsets and keyboards and, and, and things like that. So I was paying everything. I was building a law firm um, and taking all the profits that I should have kept and shoveling them into Complexity, the tune. I don't know. Back, it doesn't sound like much money now, but it sure was when it was my own money back in, you know, 2004 or 2005. I put over half a million of my own money into building Complexity in the own in the early years while expanding my law firm and then i i had ali my my daughter and we had jordan my son and you know I'm, at that point i had sold complexity to news corporation direct tv for the championship gaming series so i was working my five law firm locations monday through friday and most every weekend friday night i'd fly to la to run the los angeles complexity for the weekend and even when i was home i was on the computer doing the complexity stuff after I get done with my legal stuff, you know, so I'm working 80, 90 hours a week with, with two young kids. And that was obviously not sustainable. So my wife and I, she's, she's an amazing woman. She's, she's like, if you want to go in the sea sports thing, you think it's going somewhere, you think it's going to be worth it. Um, then, then let's go all in, let's move up to California and let's build this brand. And so I sold my law firm, moved to California in May of 2008. But for any old timers watching this video, you'll remember in the summer of 2008, oh. <laughs> the economy imploded. Yeah. And a week after my birthday, ironically, or sorry, a week after my wife's birthday, um, which is tomorrow, um, we got notice that Championship Gaming Series had been closed down. So I'd sold my law firm, I'd sold complexity, I'd moved my family across the country. And I find myself unemployed in a state that I'm not licensed to practice law. Oh my goodness! Funny enough, man, next week is the 15 year anniversary of of that phone call. Um, so yeah, that's what you want to go through if you if you want to chase your dreams, and you know you got to sacrifice time, you got to sacrifice money, you got to you got to sacrifice a lot. And then off the back of all that, um, my family was urging me to give up on this ridiculous esports idea to you know, go back, be a lawyer, live a practical, normal life. And against the best advice of all the people that love me, I bought the IP back for complexity <laughs> <laughs> and Jesus. started all over in uh, January of uh, 2009. I was doing it with Jason Bass, a friend of mine, Alice Conroy, a friend of mine. I brought in, I'm like, I can't do this myself. I have two young kids. I got to figure out how to pay the bills now. I was basically broke. Like I'd gone all in and now I don't have a job. Those were some really, really um, painful, difficult days. But together we managed to 
get it back built um, and running on, you know, this is a Twitch era and the StarCraft II era, and we're back competing with EG, which at that point, because they weren't in the Championship Gaming Series and some great management by Alex Garfield, had built a massive brand and they had Intel and, you know, all these huge companies and all this money. So we, we had to go head to head with that Goliath of an American brand uh, way back in, you know, 2009, 10, 11, 12, and, and rebuild the brand from scratch. Shit, I didn't even have a website or a single player or, or staffer under contract when I got the intellectual property back. And then we did that up until 2017 when we did the deal here. So I always encourage people to chase their dreams and, and to really get after it, whatever your dream might be, um, esports or otherwise. But you got to know, like, taking the path less traveled and, and going and doing those things it comes with scars, man. It mm -hmm. comes, it comes with tears and it, 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 people will see like the great moments when you're on a video flying in Jerry's helicopter or when you're hoisting a trophy or, or whatever, you always see that meme. It's like you, you, you see the top of the, of the iceberg. You don't see 95% of it's below and it's the work. It's the hours. It's the tears. It's the, it's the business meetings. It's the investor roadshow. It's working with that player who's calling at three in the morning, having a breakdown. It, it, it's those other thousands of things that, that really go into trying to accomplish anything in this life. You know, I think of Counter-Strike players and other competitive gamers quite often. And I, I, I try to identify like what, what are some of the core traits um, that, that make people successful. And I'm, I'm a student of history and I'm a student of success and successful people. And I read a lot of books and I've worked with a lot of gamers. And I think at least for men, there's a certain aspect of, at least in some aspects of your life, you have to be an alpha way back in the day. Um, men in particular, and I'm not saying anything negative about women i was just speaking from my experience as a man like they would the hunters would go off and and leave their loved ones behind and they'd go off and they'd take risk and they would chase down these animals the alphas would bring home the food and collectively um you know the tribe would prosper and i think when it comes to competitive gamers um there needs to be a little eye of the tiger there needs to be what i call a little fire in the belly there needs to be like hey this is not an easy lifestyle like I could put 15,000 hours into this game and travel the world and still not really get to where I want to be. And it's the same for business. And it's the same for a lot of things. Like if you don't have this hunger and this passion and this alpha and this hunter inside you, it's unlikely you're going to be able to achieve your dreams. And it's unlikely you're going to be at the top of, of an eSport. It's unlikely you're going to be at the top of a podcaster. And you can study lots of people across different ecosystems and, and different different cultures and, and different careers. I think you're going to find some similar traits there. So I guess when I was younger, maybe I had that fight and, I, I hope I still do because I don't I don't think I'm quite done here just yet. I'm I'm sure you still do. Uh, first of all, a lot of things to address there. I uh, I do hope you're using the Dallas's resources to make sure that you're taking care of yourself too, because it seems like you have a lot of great facilities for mental welfare and hopefully you know yes. you're, you're seizing those opportunities. Second thing is that. That was incredibly inspirational, and I hope everybody takes that to heart, that you really do have to go out and seize it, uh, regardless of your industry, and that applies to everybody out there. And third thing, you mentioned it briefly there, but it is a very timely and sensitive topic, the fact that evil geniuses that you brought up, you know, they were such a powerhouse in the esports space, and lately it has been a very steep decline for them. I want to know from your perspective, more or even just kind of feelings about that, to see a, a legacy brand like Evil Geniuses that has now nosedive and is essentially crashing. What, is this, what does this feel like since you've, you've kind of came up with them at the same time too? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, I think the OGs are sad. I think uh, people have been around for a long time even pre the new, the latest version of EG, are, are sad to see the brand um, definitely appears to, to be struggling. And there's a lot of uncertainty about what that course might be. And I, I certainly don't pretend to know what their plans are. Um, you just hate to see um, such a legendary brand go, going through tough times. Um, I have a lot of thoughts about 
what might have happened or, or whatever. I've learned over the years, I'm so far from perfect, I try to be really careful not to throw stones. <laughs> Okay. Because okay. at least part yeah. of my house is glass. I got windows, shit. So, um, I think there's definitely strong opinions out there. Um, we, some of uh, which are justified. Uh, some, some uh, might not be. How about how about like on a on not a... for me to, to judge? I think. Okay. Okay. If you if yeah, I would, I would have just said like on a macro level. Is there anything you would have noticed about it or or anything like? with with the org or I, actually you know what if you want to just express like the the sentimental side of it like yeah you were saying like the ogs are really like it, it does suck to see this brand just, yeah. just fall off like yeah this. even though they were one of our staunchest competitors and you know at times it was it was qu quite aggressive competition back in the day like i'm i'm still good friends with alex garfield to this day and i know so many people that have worked in that brand and i know what it means to them and and if you've been around esports long enough, like the Evil Genius brand means something to you. Um, I certainly hope that this isn't the end of of that journey, and I I doubt it is. At, at, at least I think maybe somebody else would pick it up if the current ownership group decided to move out. I have no idea what their plans are. Um, it, it's a bit frustrating, right? Mm -hmm. I think from what I'm able to ascertain on the outside looking in, they they were given a lot of resources. They, they spent some money. Remember when they bought that energy roster? Like, I know yep. what that costs. And they weren't messing around. They had a war chest of capital to, to go out and build something extraordinary and, and really do cool stuff. Um, what happened isn't for me to really speculate, and especially mm -hmm. as they're my competitor. Um, but it's unfortunate. And I do think it's one of the signs of the difficulties that we're in right now is – teams are compelling businesses but if we can't properly figure out how to monetize them and and show owners and investors and and partners like there is a future here there's there is something that we're all working towards and it's it's going to be sustainable and and a profitable business um yeah we've got we've got problems i've said it a thousand times and i'll say it a thousand more revenue generation is one of the biggest issues in esports it's not the passion it's not the expertise it's not the, the size of the audience it's not the relevancy of the content um we need we need to all get together we all need to continue to figure out new and unique ways to make money and the fans might not like all of them like mm -hmm. the first one that comes to my head is like the nfts right the first thing that pops in my head because we're, there's been different NFT projects that have been tried and, and people have tried to figure out how to how to monetize in, in the Web3 and, and blockchain world. And a lot of fans are immediately just like, oh, what are you doing? This sucks. And I don't like this. Or or we sponsorships. Maybe a group gets a sponsor and then there's, oh, why are you working with them or whatever? Here's the truth. Like, here's the reality. We're, we all love gaming or at least well, maybe not everyone in this business. We can get on about, <laughs> we can get on about grifters, but there's a lot of us. <laughs> in management and, and involved with these organizations who genuinely love gaming. Every single person out in this office, I can promise you, genu gen genuinely loves gaming. But we got to make money. Like, mm -hmm. we, we have to create a sustainable business or at least on the tier one competitive scene, none of it works. So I, I just, you know, I hope we can get some understanding from from the fan base i hope we can get some understanding that we have to try some new things um we have to try new revenue streams and if we don't like a lot of the the teams you love are going to go away a lot of the players aren't going to be able to get the salaries they need to support themselves and they're going to go away a lot a lot of things um won't work if we can't better figure out how to monetize yeah and i actually have a question about your strategy with monetization in that when you were trying to build the juggernaut and you were trying to build put together the best roster that you you could uh you guys in what's it 20 around 2019 you signed config you signed poison uh, you brought yeah. blame f on a little bit after that and everything and i think that was for a lot of people a, a big shift for complexity which had stayed such a devoutly north american org for such a long time you were pretty much only i think there would be like a couple maybe there were a couple imports here and there over the course of its history but for, primarily speaking it yeah. was it was practically just an na core team and you guys swapped over to to being a european core eventually what what kind of decisions went into that that made you value having the most competitive roster over having the most competitive north american roster yeah that's a great question and 
obviously when you're making these decisions in the time there's always a multitude of factors that go into them um the short easy version at that time was i was sick of freaking losing and i wanted to go kick some ass okay <laughs> and obviously i love america and right now we're very devoted to trying to support the american scene um but we were over i think it was we were in berlin and the team all great guys you know i had the famous um juggernaut tweet i just reached the end of my rope we'd been training we've been working we've been trying different roster combinations we were doing everything we could to try to kind of build a, a na base type of roster that could do damage we did have some success we made the you know the video uh, Re complexity resurrection um around the run to the london major but it wasn't good enough i wanted to be number one in the world i wanted to go kick people's asses and i'd had enough where you know we're an organization we didn't buy an overwatch thank goodness we didn't buy into some of these other different super expensive franchise leagues even though we had opportunity and we had capital at our disposal counter-strike was a game we decided this is our north star like this is our biggest game of course we're in some awesome other games but that was the big boy so i went to our board and i'm like i want to build something special i want to go out and galvanize our fan base i want to give people a reason to really get excited again and for the record i think i accomplished it if it wasn't for covid we were going to number one and we we're going to win a string of events like i was there i know i i know this business pretty well and there were certain at there's certain aspects of every team that need to be handled just right and we had that team pre-covid we had it in a groove and with Owen on the come up and poison just about to pop off. I mean, blame F speaks for himself. Conflict speaks for, I mean, rush, just that solid backbone. That team was going to number one and we were going to be hoisted trophies and then COVID. So you got to do it for Bulgaria. You got a young kid from Nebraska. You've got the, it's like, yeah, we did our very best to hold that together. What people are living in hotels for months on end. I mean, poor Oboe and rush living yeah. over in the European hotel for months. There was one point it got so bad. We had to get the private jet to fly them to a boot camp Cause you didn't even want people on, on flights. If you could get a flight, it's like we went above and beyond it and everything we could, but understandably under those conditions and on our lack of, we didn't have the ability to be hands-on like if we were training them primarily in our facility and really being involved with them and speaking to them each day and like building and molding this thing as we had intended you know it, it went off the rails and that was one of the biggest disappointments um i've had in esports probably in the last 10 years because we worked really really hard to assemble that roster we spent a shitload of money and i feel we succeeded in right you know we won blast online uh, blast spring and right when we were about to pop off it was kind of taken from us so that'll always be one of my big what ifs and, mm -hmm. and disappointments but uh yeah for the record that that team was going straight to number one and we were going to make a run but a lot of people lost a lot more during that period than a, than a counter-strike roster for sure um yeah. But yeah, so there were different reasons why we built that roster. The main reason was I want a reason to galvanize our fans and our partners and really be exciting, and I want to go kick ass at Counter-Strike. Yeah, that's, the showing you guys had in uh, spring 2020 groups for Blast, I think that was in, played in London, you guys, were, you guys were kicking ass. You guys looked really good on LAN, and uh, it is a shame that you guys had to go through so much in terms of, I mean, the main thing that I just remember so much from that year is seeing Rush and Oboe just in a dark room together or like it was, yeah, just playing it like was, on these webcams. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was, yeah. It was, it was tough. I, I do want to talk about one guy that was on that roster that mm -hmm. was is now like playing some incredible Counter-Strike because um, I'm sure that he was a, a guy that you were interacting with quite a bit uh, is Blame F. And yeah. I, I know like people were talking about behind the scenes. This might be the most expensive player in Counter Strike at the time. Oh, he's expensive. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and he's worth it. He's a great, yeah. great guy. Yeah. What was? What do you think? Uh, or what have you gained from uh, just getting to work hand in hand with him? Because I'm sure there was a nice like back oh, and forth with, great, with information. I, I mean, we were obviously communicating from across the pond, and I was at that time trying to recruit Alexi B to be IGL and, and blame was going to come on 
um, and just play as a as a fragger. And mm. I got to the point. I'm literally over here at the gym one day, and I'm talking with Alexi B, and we're going back and forth. And I could tell he was waffling. This was, I think, probably like a Tuesday, like 11 a.m. my time, and I could tell he's waffling. And I I came back. I came over to the office, and I met with a couple of my managers, and I said. This kid's going to waffle and he's going to flake. He's going to take another offer. Mm. And I'm like, get me a plane ticket. I'm going to Helsinki. So I literally drove my car home. (laughs) Our director of ops, Scott Ford, followed me. I threw a bunch of shit in a bag and he drove me to the airport and I hopped on a plane and flew to Helsinki. And did my damnedest to convince Alexi B to uh, come be our IGL. But on on that, I failed, unfortunately. But my next flight, I'm like, hell, I'm already over in Europe. I hopped another flight and uh, went over and met Blame. And I'm like, I'm coming. I'll be there tonight. He's just like, WTF? Like, what the hell? Is this guy crazy or what? (laughs) So he met me in my hotel. And we went to dinner. We hung out for a few hours. And he's like, look, this is what it's going to take. Like, moving to America is a big deal. da 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 And I'm like, all right. Like, what's your price? And, uh basically had a handshake from there and i'm like i hope alexi comes if he doesn't you're my IGL. he's like i got you and and the rest is history so yeah there's a there's a story for for your viewers and (laughs) and again sometimes the things that you need to do if you really want to be the best and you really want to go the extra mile you gotta (laughs) what you got like a schedule laid out for the whole day and you're you're doing your gym time and next thing you know you're on you're on a flight to uh helsinki (laughs) the joys of esports (laughs) That's fantastic. I haven't actually, I don't even know if I've heard anything like that with a, a CEO by all, like maybe a manager would make that flight, but you're the CEO of the damn company. You you And you went yeah. personally to both yeah. these guys to try to convince them. Yes. That's okay. Absolutely. Yeah. The level of dedication there is crazy. <laughs> and also you'll kind of hear about that stuff in traditional American sports, but it's like a flight across the country maybe, but you're flying right. to a whole nother <laughs> continent. Yes. Like that's, Okay. Yeah. Really. Some my... things I'm willing to do for this company, man. Like you have to, you have to want it. Like I've had multiple conversations, even with like sponsors or whatever in different corners of the world. Like do I got to be on a flight to Sydney. Like do I, you want me in London tomorrow? If you're not willing to do that and you don't set up your life and prepare your loved ones, like, Hey, this is what we're doing right now. Like dad might not be around much. Dad might be on a, you know, a plane to Paris tomorrow. Um, I think you're not, you're, oh, not you're, so you're getting Zywoo. So your you're family. Is that what you're saying? Oh yeah. I actually, uh, asked Vitality one time, like, what's the price? And they kind of laughed and like, <laughs> I don't even think we could come up with a price. This is around that same time, actually. Um, oh, really? Yeah. Nicholas and everyone over at Vitality, they're good friends. And I went over and toured their, their headquarters and joked about stealing Zywoo from them. It's, it's all part of the fun. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, Vitality seem like they're doing stuff really well too. Um, yeah, they're, let's... they run a fantastic organization. Yeah, consummate professionals. Let's move forward then to what you guys are working with now because there was another cool little, I'd say, behind-the-scenes sort of shuffle going on where the murmurs, the rumors was were that Elige was joining Evil Geniuses. That 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 is how it looked from the outside. Yeah, Even yeah. in your release video where you guys <laughs> grabbed him, you made fun of that fact. Uh, so how close was that actually to happen? Like, what, what, how close was he to joining? You? Oh, I, I mean, I don't want to speak for his business, but I think everybody knows. Yeah, it was, it was pretty close. And a lot of times running an organization in esports, you're always playing like a form of 3D chess. Like not only are the pieces going this way, they're also going this way. And you're yeah. always on the phone. And, you know, it's a Jerry Maguire shit. And I love yes, that. Yes. Sometimes yeah. it gets annoying, but I, I love that stuff in general. And yeah. You know, we obviously had let um, him and Liquid know that we thought it'd be a really good fit. We'd love to work with him. He was in conversations um, with other organizations at that time. And I feel really blessed and excited um, that it worked out for us. You know, I had high expectations of him coming in, just, you know, as you would of anyone of Leach's caliber. But he's surpassed every expectation so far, just in humility and professionalism and worth that work ethic and leadership and you can my content team makes different comms videos sometimes on our on our social channels you know recording the team's comms in like live competitive matches and the one thing they came to me and they're like jason you gotta see this um it was from sydney and they're like listen to these comms and the thing that even struck my my uh you know content team was how calm everybody was like, you've got all this money in the line. You have a giant 
auditorium full of people. You're playing freaking phase for crying out loud. And these other top, top teams, and they're just calm, man. Just like, yep, okay, let's roll over here. Let's rotate. Like, we were just really taken aback. And a lot of that, if not all of that, comes from Alige and his consummate professionalism and his experience on the big stage. And we're very honored that he's a part of our organization. And sometimes things don't work out like the Alexi thing. And uh, sometimes they do like the Alige thing. And either way, you just got to pick yourself up and kick and claw and scratch and fight and keep pushing forward. Yeah, so you mentioned the fact that Elige has had some sort of effect. Like, is that was that incredibly noticeable? Like, because there was obviously... It was almost immediate. Okay, okay, yeah. Almost immediate. Like, he just reset the paradigm of how you approach the game. Um, for everything from practice to comms to attitude to... Like I said, sometimes people come into an organization in a capacity you have a certain expectation and you're really disappointed. Um, I don't remember the last time I had such high expectations for a player and they actually exceeded the, almost, exceeded them almost immediately. So all those Elise fans out there, like, yeah, he's a real deal. Um, and he's a consummate professional. Feel very, very fortunate to have him in the organization. The exceeding expectations is just just to give my input on this like it it really he truly did i i mean when some people saw the move for fang for him i think many of us just like analysts in the space pundits looked at it and said yeah alicia is better at these roles but the the way that the culture seemingly changed for you guys and that whereas before you could read the emotions of everybody on complexity so much more obviously yeah. like like it was almost kind of uh what kind of halzerk are we going to see today is he going to be pounding yeah. the table or is he going to be the guy that lifts everybody's spirits but now i'm not i guess i'm not going to say you guys are like flatline but it's just seemingly more focused more drilled yeah and i think that's a great observation and it's something the casual fans don't really they'll be like well he's a fragger or he's a lurk or like they don't set up the op right and maybe those things are true but there's so many other intangibles go into a successful team just the work ethic the personalities the discipline the the daily mental attitude like solving for interpersonal problems like there's so many other things beyond just like oh he doesn't hold an angle worth the shit it's like <laughs> yeah anybody can see that but it's the things you don't see that's why a lot of times the casual fan will see this news post on hltv or wherever be like holy crap recently one that that kind of came up was like jks where i think a lot of people were shocked and caught off guard and I don't know anything about that. So what I'm about to say has nothing to do with that. It's just an example of being a, where the average person, the average fan might be like, oh, my gosh, that makes no sense. There's always 80 things going on behind the curtain. Mm. Interpersonal relationships, work ethic, homesickness, like go on and on and on and on. And there's always a lot more going on where sometimes you'll see roster shovels or roster changes. You'll be like, that makes no sense on paper strategically. And you might be right. But there's a lot more going on behind the curtain. Mm. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. How about for one guy that I think is starting to gain some credit for the team, but people had their doubts about for some time was JT, your sole South African representative and in-game leader for the team. What has it been like working with, with Johnny for the time that you've had? Really good. Really good. Um, we, I can genuinely say we really enjoy everyone on that roster. Um, of course, sometimes since there's, there's going to be business that needs to be done, contracts and things like that. Um, you know, sometimes we're not, sometimes we're basically competitors, right? I don't know if people understand that sometimes the orgs are almost competitors with the agents and stuff with the players, you know, it's just like the mm -hmm. Cowboys across the street. But once that stuff gets handled, like they are just genuinely some of the nicest, most respectful, chill, cool people we've had the, the the opportunity to work with in recent years and uh jt is insanely smart and he he could be streaky right sometimes he'll be like holy shit he just took over that match and he beat o astralis in overtime by himself on overpass and these yeah, things and other yeah. times you're like where is this guy come on what's going on no but uh he is just an amazing person and he's really a brilliant strategic mind and works well um with the coaching staff 
on developing different game plans. And and now that Elijah's kind of come alongside with a fresh objective point of view and how we should be approaching different situations, how we should be adjusting in game and, and, and approaching different opponents. Um, it's fun to watch. And are, are we going to skyrocket to number one and go on a crazy run like FaZe has? I don't know, probably not. Um, but when we're working with such great guys and we're able through this combination that we have to represent the U S counter-strike market as the leading brand and leading squad from the region, I think there's value to that. And I hope Americans get behind that. Like, you know, maybe we're not going to be the crazy number one run and help. Maybe we will, but I'm just, you know, trying to set expectations here, but sticking with North America is, I don't know, Team USA in a way, and Elise and Flop and, and Grimm and, and, you know, and then you get the Halser come in and, and, and Jay, like, it's a cool team, man. Mm-hmm. You have to cheer for this team. We might <laughs> not be the big, sexy superstars of, of some of these other teams, um, but these guys, these guys are out battling. They're putting it all out there. They're gone from home, you know, north of two, 250 days a year being an American team and they're in Australia and then they're boot camping in Europe. And then they're, you know, going over to the blast finals. Like they are sweating and bleeding and scratching and clawing every day for this game. So I just really hope the American fans can get behind us. Not only American fans, but you know, American counter-strike needs some help. COVID COVID was almost a knockout punch combined with, you know, a lot of players going to Valorant Yeah, and we're trying to do right by this scene. And our players are trying to do right by this scene. And all we ask is that you get behind us, like tweet at us, like get in our discord, like support this team and support this organization. We're, we're, we're trying to keep the, the candle on, you know, the candle lit, the lights on and the hope alive for counter-strike in North America. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. I think you guys right now are holding that torch pretty high right now. I mean, as of the HLTV rankings, number six right now. And for for this, and you look at some of the teams that are actually ranked above you right now, and some of them have they're in flux right now. You don't know what yeah. they're, how they're going to do with some of the roster moves that are on the horizon or at least rumored. So there's a chance you guys rise up even more beyond beyond the fact that you guys are doing it via your own merit but the fact that everybody else is kind of scrambling right now and you oh, yeah, guys seem yeah. like a more steady force yeah and so, to be fair like the game's still brand new yeah so yeah. like we're not running around like hey mfers look at us we're number six you know <laughs> we're not like that yeah, like we we try we try to be humble in success you know and gracious and and, and when we lose but yeah. let's all be honest here this game is brand new yeah, like yeah, yeah. they're working hard on it, but we also know like we've got a ton of work to do. We need to continue to adapt as the game um, is developed, and you know, I, I, like phases run spectacular. But I promise you, those veterans would be like, we get like the game's brand new. In in nine months, the game could be quite different, and it's everyone's duty and obligation to put together the best roster they can and continue individually to adapt to the nuances of the game to be as competitive as you can. Who Who's going to be the best in CS2? I mean, we're, we're probably not going to have any idea for, what, maybe at least a year. I remember when CSGO came out. Holy crap, was that a dumpster fire? <laughs> it was bad. Like, it was, like it was yeah. way worse than CS2. All these people freaking out about CS2, and now they're like, oh, the you know, the player counts going down this game's in the dumpster this is crap and it's like yeah you know it's a painful transition whenever you make this move but cs go was way worse oh yeah there was a period where i thought cs might be dead that's how bad go was when it came out so like i'm down for cs2 they need to keep improving it um but those of us around back in those days remember what that game was like in the game and some of the teams that were like early super dominant and cs go a year or two years in like you know, it wasn't the same. So we're super happy to be in top 10 right now, but we have a lot to prove and a lot to earn moving forward. Yeah, I didn't even, I'll be completely honest. First year, a couple of years of CSGO, I really didn't even like watching nor playing it. I, I thought it was just like, this it was is so a, bad. Man. This is a disgrace like, to like what Counter-Strike so is bad. being. Yeah. It uh, was bad. What, so sure, I, I don't sure. think there's a better person to ask than the the CEO what what complexities objectives are right now. So I, yeah, in your eyes, you you talk about you know you don't necessarily need number one. You don't need to like win every single thing moving forward. But what's a realistic expectation yeah. that you would set at, in front of your players, especially? The objective is to win, to win everything, to win all the time, to dominate, and kick people's asses. Now 
you have an objective, but you also want to have realistic expectations. So there's not big letdowns and, and friction in the organization where there doesn't need to be friction. Um, I think the expectations are that we continue to work with this team in a way that sets them up for success and give them the best possible support we can give them. And we expect them to come to work each day with a good attitude, to be disciplined and, and to to really continue to work together as a squad, knowing this thing can be a roller coaster, um, knowing when you're way up on, on a high, like arguably we are now, keep your head in check. Like, and when you're on a low, you're not just all depressed and, and in your head. It's, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And uh, we're excited to be entering this game. We seriously think we've got one of the most interesting, compelling rosters in the world, win or lose. And uh, yeah, we're going to see where this goes. But the the goal is always to be winning. That's it. We're in a competitive business. The goal is to win. Yeah, and that goes back all the way to the the white button up, red tie look that you <laughs> you push forward. I still have those ties, man. Let me know in the comments. What do you do? You, do you miss the red and black? Uh, do you like the blue? You know. You never know what uh, curveballs like and throw at you, Maui. You just, mm. you just never know. <laughs> I kept all my old red and black shit, so you never know. Yeah, like actually, okay, I don't. So for there, there will be people listening to this that don't know what that look was about. I want to, I want to bring it back and probably end here on like a you know a softer note. Like you, you were standing behind the team. You were one of the first people that was like pacing back and forth, you know, yeah. yelling at your players, like making sure hyping them up, not not just yelling at yeah. them like bad things, but like trying to get them motivated, trying to get their head in the game. So what like. And, and I remember seeing you before at these events, you at, at CGI. I think I remember seeing you at New Egg Land in like Ontario or yes, California. Yes, you won that. Yeah, yes. exactly. You won that one too. Um, there were, and, and you, you stood out, you stood out because you were, you looked like someone that should be on the sideline of an NFL game. At, yes. But, and like, that's, that's who I am. That's who I am. Like, that's where my heart is. That's where my passion is with the players out going to war, battling in video games, and doing everything we can collectively to find success and and accomplish really cool things and 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 be exciting to our fans and and our supporters. Like I said, what, what and I I, I laugh because I said this conversation the other day. One of, one of my biggest quote unquote regrets from scaling the company and being more successful and having access to more capital to do better by our gamers and do more stuff for our fans is how much time I have to spend corporate now. Mm. It's corporate, corporate, corporate. And people always say like, oh, what game are you playing right now? And I'm like, you know, the, the irony of, of really working at senior levels in the gaming industry is you don't have any time to play games. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, It's like, I have a family. Like, I, it's like, damn. And it's funny. It's like, you almost get to a certain level of, of some kind of success and you're so busy doing the things you need to do that you don't get to do the things you love to do. Like I love being backstage with the team before they come out. I love screaming until my voice doesn't work anymore, you know, <laughs> at the events. I love being at the events, meeting the fans, but if that's all I did, it would all kind of crumble. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I hope people know cause it does bother me sometimes. Like, I'm still as passionate as I ever was. I still love the gamers we work with as much as I ever have. It's just, uh, you know, somebody's got to somebody's got to do the adulting, I guess, and somebody's got to do the boardrooms and and the finances and spreadsheets and the sales and and all those things. So, and you know, you have to step into roles and you have to do what needs to be done. And if I had just really focused on my passion of only being with the gamers and, and traveling with them and because that's what i really love i don't think complexity would even be around anymore um so i, I do what i need to do when i need to do it and um uh, yeah i hope i hope to be at more events next year this year was a real sparse year for me and i, I miss meeting the fans and and i miss getting to events because that's where my passion flows from and and that's where my heart is and i think the complexity because partially because of that partially because of the people we choose to join our family is truly one of the most passionate and genuine organizations in the world i'm not putting down any organizations there's lots of really good organizations we're not the biggest we're not the flashiest we don't necessarily the most 
trophies, but when it comes down to just being gamers and really loving what we do and what brings us to work every day, like uh, I'm pretty proud of the people I get to work with every day. And uh, we're just going to keep pushing forward and fighting and doing our best for our fans. Yeah. And uh, once again, just truly appreciate the the way that even though you've had to in some ways hang up the mouse i think your efforts and contributions are allowing people like the players on your rosters to continue playing under a banner that they know they're going to find support from and for that i just want to say you know thank you for making a legacy brand in North America that still has stood the test of time for 20 years now before many people that are watching this were even alive. You guys were making a space. You, you guys I'm were making so a old. splash. Yeah, it's, yeah, but that's how it is now, isn't it? You know, that's just how this goes. That's how, that's how it is. You know, and I want to throw it right back at you and all the people, obviously it's more of a Counter-Strike um, f- focused podcast and I don't want other gamers in our rosters or other 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 fans be like, oh, why do you talk about this or that? I want to specifically shout out to all the people who are still grinding, man, in, in the Counter-Strike ecosystem. I see you guys. I might watch your podcast more than you would think. Like, I'm in the forums whenever I can be trying to read and, and see what people think. And, you know, even though I might not actively be part of these conversations, I'm pretty chill on social media. Um, I'm almost always up to date with them and, and understand both sides of 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 these issues and shout out to everyone, you know, the, the announcers and, and the tech people and the league people and the podcasters. Um, we have a really rich special ecosystem. And sometimes it saddens me that we get at each other's throats. Um, sometimes over really trivial, non important things when we should all kind of be rolling in the same direction. I'm not saying always be yes, yes, yes to each other. Um, healthy debate is is good, but damn, man, like we're trying to build Counter Strike together, so let's be respectful. Let's let's have fun and treat each other well, and not forget about people's dignity and and human value just because they're on the other side of a forum or or a, a Twitter handle. Like, let's make Counter Strike something that people want to be a part in, and not chase them off with vitriol and just anger and some of the garbage that we see out there. Like, let's do this thing together. Let's treat each other well. Let's make sure we keep laughing a lot and uh, being good to each other. Yeah, that's uh, incredibly well said. Thank you so much for your time, Jason. Thanks for having me, brother. Of course, of course. Uh, I'm glad. I mean, I was just in some ways shocked you were down for it. And uh, I'm so so glad you did. I'm so glad you did. Um, Keep up the good work, man. I got to go finish your... uh, your other Richard Lewis podcast here. I didn't get to finish it. So you're doing great, man. You're a great interview. You have great questions. Um, you're kicking ass as always. So thank you for having me, man. It's an honor. All right. That's going to be it. Thank you. And uh, as always, everybody, being toxic is a choice. <laughs> <laughs>